Good now, everybody, and welcome back to Faceless Labs. It's Evan and Alex here with another tutorial, and this one is an important check-in. It's a gut check, because probably one of the most common questions we get is, when is a good time to buy Bitcoin? Or when is a good time to sell Ethereum? Or is this enough? Or is this too much? People who are asking our opinions about a question only they can answer, but they don't have a system to check in with themselves. We want to teach you today our systems and help you get some insight about the kind of questions you can ask to, to determine, am I over leveraged? Am I not diversified enough? And right away, Alex, I want to kick it over to you because you did a great video about this just recently on TikTok. And you talked about why this is important and also just a couple of the steps that people can take to, to recognize this as something that should be an essential part of their skill set. What do you think? Yeah, no, it's a it's a really good question. I, I made that video for two reasons. One, because I thought it was a helpful piece of, of content that somebody would find value in, of course. Uh, but then two, because even though this is now my third cycle in the crypto space and I've been here for a little bit, I need reminders myself to not only set up parameters for myself and my trading system and my own personal strategy, but I need to remind myself to stick to it. Because, you know, as I've said before, the number one thing that will screw you over in the crypto space is breaking your own rules. And I do it all the time. And the conversation, that internal turmoil that you can have with yourself to convince yourself to break your own rule is, as Jimmy McMillan would say, it's too damn high. So, <laughs> you know, we got, we got to do something. So a gut check like this is exactly what we need to do. And just because, you know, right now the markets are down a little bit, this is a great time to do it because I'm sure that a lot of people are feeling some different mixed emotions looking at the state of their portfolio right now, especially if they have bought things recently and they might be looking at portfolios that are in the red. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So what are some of the indicators to you when you're watching crypto news that it's time for you to do a gut check? So basically it's just whenever I see red, whenever I see, you know, something that immediately picks up steam, on the social networks or the the different media outlets, you know, that has any of the black swan vibe to it, you know, like uh -huh. people in crypto are constantly talking about the the impending black swan event, you know, what could it be and how bad is it going to be, which leads to, you know, a bunch of people who might have made, uh, you know, poorly informed purchasing decisions about cryptocurrency, or just poorly timed dollar cost average buys or whatever it might be. Uh, to question whether or not the whole world is coming to an end and whether or not all of their investments are going. I, I can't tell you, it's probably been a good two dozen DMs in the past week uh, mm -hmm. from viewers, from followers, from fans of the show who have been asking me like, hey, in your opinion, should I sell all of my whatever? You know, and I'm just like, I really, I really can't answer that for you. Um, but I can, I can tell you my thought process around myself and when I make the determination to sell something. So that's what we're here for today. Man, that's great. And I always say to those people, I say, listen, I say the fact that you are asking that question is an indicator that you need to start paying attention and yes. asking yourself. For me, the, honestly, the most fundamental important question that we'll probably talk a little past, but I think you should know is, do I know how to move in and out of this asset? I myself often will buy something first and ask questions later but have made it a part of my practice. When I bridge to a new blockchain, when I stake a new asset, I always review the exit process first. I know how to turn my dollars into crypto and my crypto back into cash, but if I'm using a new platform for the first time, it's always a little bit different. There's maybe a lockup period or a fee I didn't know about, and learning that on the front end from having not done it on the back end before, that gives me a lot more peace of mind about anything I move into. But I would say too much of the time, people don't do that most important first yeah. step. The bridging the other day, one of the steps I looked at before I bridged some ETH over to the base network on the base bridge, I, it was an instant transfer. And I was like, oh, I wonder how long it takes to get it back. And don't ask me why I asked that, because most people would probably assume, I would have assumed, and I looked and it's a seven day trip right. via the base bridge to go back to the Ethereum network. And boy, I'm glad I looked at that so For that sure. I can find another solution to make another plan. But what are some of those other things? Yeah, I mean, it just... It's a, it, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to it, say. It is hard. It is hard. But like, okay, so education is like a key part of it. But I it don't is. know. I would also say like, what's your emotional reaction to the news? Or, or like if, I don't know, maybe a quarterly check-in. One of the ones I do is like hardware wallet. We talk about hardware wallet. Do you do this? Tell me. 
Um, I will often buy stuff online with a hardware or a software wallet, my MetaMask connected to an exchange. And my practice is I like to move those assets if I'm holding them for a long time onto my hardware wallet. Sure. It's not connected to the internet, it's safer there. Less likely I'm gonna screw it up. But sometimes I'll leave an asset in a software wallet for a long time. And one of my red flags, my gut checks to myself is I will see that asset when I open my wallet or if I haven't opened my wallet in a while and it's there, I'll say, oh, that's a sign to me that probably across my whole portfolio, I need to take a second sure, and maybe transfer some stuff to my hardware wallet because it's going to make me feel a lot safer. I'm not going to be as vulnerable. And if that one asset is vulnerable, what's my other stuff doing? Do I know yeah. where it all is? Um, so I try to do stuff regularly like that a couple times, a you know, monthly, quarterly kind of thing. And then there's yeah. stuff I do maybe annually, like, I don't know, am I, am I holding too much Bitcoin? Have I sold it lately? Kind of thing. So, okay. That makes a lot more sense. I, yeah. First, I asked you a very open-ended question the first time it got kind of philosophical. No, no, no. I, I got you. I, I think that I would say for me, everything that prompts me to gut check really has never focused too much on the locations of my different stuff, but more, you know, my conviction in the decision to continue to hold something or to potentially look at something else. And okay. one of the first things that I always do, and this, and this took years to get to this point, because back in the day, my first time experiencing a big correction, hundred percent, I was doing the same thing. I was panicking. I was, you know, it's like, Oh my God, um, I put in X and it's worth, you know, half of that right now. This is terrible. Uh, should I sell it all? And really now looking back, that was the immediate indication that I put in way too much. I invested way more than I could afford to lose. I might've thought that it was okay. And I really only made that. I really only thought that because someone probably that I was watching online, some influencer, some content creator, or, you know, just the general vibe in the space yeah. was that we're up only. So I, I wasn't thinking about losing it. I was thinking about how much it was going to make me if it did what they all said it was going to do. You know, this this actually really happened for me when um, FTX went down. And before that, I feel like what, what were like the dominoes that toppled? There was like a Binance scare. There was a yeah. something else. Gate IO went offline. It wasn't because they did something nefarious. But then FTX, um, BlockFi happened. All these things. I was a Celsius. BlockFi client. Celsius. I mean, and like, fortunately, most of the time I have not been, I was not an FTX client. I was not a Celsius client. Um, but when events like that happen, I notice what my own reaction to it is. It's like, oh, am I staking too much over here on another protocol? Yeah. Or like the KuCoin scare we had recently. People are worried that US investors might need to move their assets off KuCoin. That was a signal to me. I had assets on KuCoin. And I noticed it was enough that if it went away, bye-bye tomorrow, I would be a little bit sad <laughs> that I hadn't gone and gotten it. So those kind of indicators, you get them and you, you just act on them. You don't panic about it, but you act on them. Uh, you know, should right. I sell means maybe it's time to take some profits. Yeah. Can't go broke taking profits, right? No, exactly. We said it in the meme coin video and it applies there especially, but it, you can really take this rule and go anywhere. If you are able to walk to the crypto table and at any point stand up with more money than you sat down with, you just, you won and you should look at that as a win. And I think it's really easy for people to get blinded by someone on crypto Twitter telling them that they're a paper handed wuss for selling right now because this thing is destined to do a 200 X from here. Yeah. And more often than not, spoiler alert, people who post things like that are either barely exposed to the project or they're not exposed at all to the project, or they are personally panicking and trying to get other people to join them. Uh, in we call that exit liquidity in the yeah. business. We call that exit liquidity. We call that being a salty bag holder. Yeah, <laughs> put it on a t-shirt. I actually, the inverse yeah. of that is true too. And I have a good story about that. Can I tell you one of my stories now? Um, Please. Is you can also be so over invested in something that maybe at one time it was great. And maybe fundamentally it's very sound. I think there are a lot of companies or products or projects that, you know, have just got a great product, but they don't have the attention uh, the narrative has shifted, and sometimes the the short burst of bull is over. The bear market comes, and they don't have the funds to sustain themselves. How many great companies have we seen come and go because they, they just couldn't keep it up? And that last top was really the last top, whether it's a meme token or it's an L1. And um, I remember in 
2020, 2021, DeFi was really hot and people were starting to experiment with this new sort of protocol where it was like an exchange, but it was decentralized, had its own token. It was Uniswap, but lighter. Pancake swap, burger swap, chicken tender swap. They're exploding on the Binance smart chain because it was way cheaper than Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And they all had their own platform token that was, of course, a wise investment if the platform had volume and attention because they needed to use that token to cover when people wanted to trade their Bitcoin for Ethereum or yep. there's a lot of BNB. They didn't just do some press the digitation and transform the token. They didn't have a little green man in the chest. No, they would sell that token, cover it with their platform's token, and then go buy the other token and give it to you. And so there was a high incentive for all those platforms to reward users who bought their token and staked it just gave it back to the platform to do banking stuff with DeFi, baby. And the hottest one was pancake swap and cake token was just gorgeous. I mean, oh, I feel right. like we were talking about it when it was single digit dollars. I know some people who got it when it was in the sense fractions mm -hmm. of a dollar. And that token had a pretty epic, almost up only journey to about $36, uh, plenty X. And it mm -hmm. was a legitimate product. It had, the best feature around at the time, which was stake it and earn more of it. And right. what, what more can you ask for than passive income on a token that's going up in price? Am I right? For and sure. so I can remember getting in and watching it go up and staking my cake and just making my bag bigger and bigger. And then the price, as it sometimes does, started to, to, to plateau. And then it started to go down a little bit. But that was okay because I was still earning a really great APY. And then as more and more people found out about the platform, well, they couldn't keep paying that high APY anymore because there weren't as many people using it. So there wasn't as much demand for your token to do their banking stuff with. And Not so sustainable. that number started to go down. And then other platforms like it started to pop up. And with my 2020 hindsight, what I can see is a pretty common chart in DeFi platforms that you know looks like this, goes up for a while, and then it never comes quite back to its glory. Right. And a lot of people are talking about Cake specifically right now. Uh, in 2024 when we're making this video. And it's kind of having a, a sort of resurgence. Uh, not the same kind of flavor because it's not new like it was then, but there's just a tension on DeFi again. People are here. And it's a little if stale. I was, it's, it's what? It's a little stale. It's a little stale cake, but you know, cake in the freezer is, is still cake, no? And I, I kind of like it sure. cold. So, you know, if I could go back and do it again though, I spent way too long in that investment learning while I felt uncomfortable about it. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty lucky that for the most part, with all the percentage gains and all the price gains, I, I more or less broke even. I, I had a bit of a loss, but it wasn't such a bad loss. And what it taught me was, as you say, no one ever went broke taking profits. I did not have a profit taking strategy that I was successfully practicing every time at that yep. time. And I was learning about really a new type of investment, new to me type investment. And figuring out how to navigate it. I would not go back and put quite as much money in and I wouldn't hesitate to take money out, to take profits out and move the money I was comfortable losing forward to see what happens. Now, I'm much more comfortable with that. When, when things like that tank, I, I don't worry about it anymore because I usually haven't invested a, a, an amount of money that's going to affect me right. in the way. No, it's, it's, it's really worth mentioning again and again, because now, now that I have learned enough of the lesson, the hard way, I'm at the point where the only feeling of, and I hate to use the word regret here, but the only feeling of regret that I ever get is that like, I didn't buy more of something that did really well that I like, I had, you know, I was like, okay, I'm looking at this token. I feel like it's going to do well. Let me get a little bit of it. And then it does really well. I'm like, I should have believed in myself more. I can tell you from a lot of personal experience that's a lot easier to go to sleep at night thinking than, oh my God, I'm ruined. Because, I really screwed up. <laughs> yeah. And and I just, you know, it's okay. I get I get a bunch of comments. You, if you go look at the comments on that gut check video, there's a lot of people who are just a combination of, I really needed to hear this right now, or this was me last bull run. Um, I'm feeling great right now. And everyone who told me they're feeling great, I'm like, that is proof right in front of your face that you are sticking to some sort of strategy and whatever it is, is working. Uh, cause exactly the inverse of what you just described, Evan, I had the most rigid price, uh, excuse me, profit taking strategy of all time in my first bull run. Really? And I never followed it once because it was too complicated. I was like, okay, 
for every 25% that the token increases in price, I'm going to sell a 25% uh, of my allocation. And that way I always keep some and I always take some off the table. And then I was like, I can't do math on the fly. So like, oh, it's up today. How much of it am I supposed to sell? Whatever. It's going up, baby. Let's keep it going. Yeah. And yeah. then I would just keep it in. I'm like, no, if I take it out now and it does another 25%, I'm going to miss out on all of this money. And so I kept it all in there. And then I rode the whole thing straight back down to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest was there a particular loss, token that happened on that was really painful or? Yes. Well, there's a couple. Because I'm going to go mean, back and look at the chart and try and relive the drama with you. <laughs> right. No, there's a few. Um, I, I am I, the one that sticks out in my head. I think more than the other ones, just because there was so many contributing factors that went into my decision to purchase and to go in big, uh, was probably Cardano. And I would say that for a couple reasons, because on its face and travel back in time, if you will, with me to the time when Cardano did not have smart contracts and they were about oh to. Oh my gosh. You yeah, remember? I remember the right? hype. <laughs> yeah. So in the year or two leading up to that, I, in my, you know, much greener state than I am now, was just optimistically looking to the future when Cardano was going to get smart contracts and instantly go to $20. They were going to bank Africa. Yep. They were going to connect the whole globe. It was over. Yep. Everyone was going to learn Haskell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and just to put it in perspective, it never even occurred to me at that time to ask my dad, like, Hey dad, is Haskell like make any kind of sense for this? Like, is this any sort of, why didn't I ask him? I have no idea because I thought that I knew enough. And anyway, I just, you know, it was so many influencers talking about it and I wasn't doing proper research. I was a victim of confirmation bias. I would, you know, instead of Googling like problems with Cardano, I would just Google Dear Google, why is Cardano the best cryptocurrency of all time? Send, and then I find a Reddit post that's just like Cardano to the moon. And I'm like, boom, that's proof that I need more. Send more. And then exactly like you said with K2, I remember sitting there thinking, okay, well, this is great because even if the price goes down a little bit, I can stake it and I can earn pretty good interest the whole time. Uh, oh, and then the next, the, the cherry on top of this whole thing was the big Sunday swap um, ISO coming. Oh yeah. I remember everyone wanted to stake their Cardano in anticipation of getting this new Dex token. Yep. Cake yep. was so hot. We needed Sunday. I remember. Oh my God, dude. They, that thing was so hyped and I, I bought into it hook, line and sinker and I was so stoked about it and the plan was great. And in Sunday swaps defense, the UI was good. The thing seemed like it probably could have done well, could have, could have worked but they dragged their feet on it for so long. The reward structure for what you staked was so terrible. It was Paul. I, I vividly remember sending them a message or something saying, you know, like just making sure that I got like an appropriate allocation because I'm blown away by how much ADA I was staking and how little Sunday I got for it. Yeah. <laughs> like, is this, is this legit? Was this like a sample transaction first or is it? Cause it was, dude, I'm talking thousands of dollars worth of ADA staked for a long time, like from day one that that pool opened until the day that the payout happened. And um, I think that I ended up getting like a couple, a couple like ten, tens of yeah. dollars. Yeah, you know, like I had a, about a thousand dollars stake and I remember getting dollars and yeah. being like, what? Yeah. <laughs> really? really? And I don't so, think the token did anything either. No, no, it, it ended up being a total flop. I mean, the epitome of a flop. And obviously, since then, we've seen just pretty, pretty poor price action from from Cardano. And, you know, you've just added a lot to your knowledge repertoire. And, yeah, uh, you know, just made a lot of determinations and personal growth and a lot of different realizations about, you know, how you were over leveraged and all of these kinds of things. So really just bring up these two stories of loss to let everybody know that it's okay if you feel like that because all of us were there at one point. Uh, none of us know everything about this space and it's never a bad idea to take a feeling that you have. Like the second you get that visceral emotional response to something that's happening in the markets, you should use that and try to figure out like, okay, what can I do to avoid doing this in the future? And the easiest way to nutshell that is if you feel bad, you went in too hard and you need to pull back a little bit and it's okay to not go quite so heavy. Uh, because it is way better to have been able to potentially get a bigger return than it is to lose your investment because, you know, it didn't go your way.
Great time. And then if you feel good, you should just let that be a good indication to you that you're on the right path and you're doing the right thing. And if you're feeling, you know, not excited about the return and feeling bad about, you know, not having more capital or something like that. I mean, all of these things are just all different little pieces yep. that you can add yeah, into. Don't your be future. so tied to any one asset or investment or plan, you know, or hope yeah. for the future that you can't, you know, move. No, know, know how to pivot. Know how to pivot and also know how to research, check out, check up on all your assets, how to move them in and out, like we said, educating yourself. And yeah. you don't want to just rely on others. You don't want to rely on your favorite influencer to tell you when to buy, when to sell, what token to pick. That's not the strategy for success, but it absolutely is a strategy for success to get in a community of people who you can talk to who are interested in this stuff just like you. And honestly, I'm going to tell you the best place to be if you made it to the end of this video is the Rise Up Morning Show Faceless Labs community. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this video and stay tuned for more videos like this. Leave us a comment with your questions, with that bag that you lost. And don't forget to sign up for the Rise Up Morning Show newsletter. We're live Monday through Thursday on TikTok, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. It's early for our friends in California. It's late for our friends in New Zealand. And not everybody has time to come to a live show four days a week. So we've got the newsletter, the best briefest bullets. We've got the comment section here on YouTube, and we've got a free Discord community where you can come hang out, talk with us and the faceless many so that we can share what we know, ask our questions, learn, grow, and rise up together. That's what it's all about. Alex, do you have uh, final thoughts, good jokes, words of wisdom before we uh, take our ponies and ride? Yeah, no, I've got uh, I've got nothing to add. I just, I just think that we should always be pushing to learn more and to make sure that we are continuing to evolve and move forward in the space. There should never be anything that happens that goes by as a wasted opportunity to learn something. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who is an educator or who is a constant student will tell you that your education journey never ends and you can learn even in the throes of panic and despair yeah. because you're all leveraged. Um, you know, it's not a fun lesson to learn. I've, I've been there. Um, it sucks, but you can use it to protect yourself in the future. So that's why we do these gut checks. Everything can be a gut check. And uh, I would encourage you to find a group, like Evan said, join us in the community, find a group of people to commiserate with, because when the thing crashes, we're all in there together watching you know, watching the red flow in the streets and, you know, bandying theories back and forth about when it's going to come back. How long is it going to last? Um, it's it's to company and there's nothing like the friends you made along the way. You exactly. Know? Yeah. It's better to commiserate in a group than it is to do it by yourself. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And then what you learn the hard way, maybe somebody else can learn the easy way. And, and 100%. That's what you're here for. so 100%. thank you for joining us, my friends until next time, rise up.